Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast with Robert. Robert, for everyone out there listening, would you please introduce yourself? Yes. First of all, thanks for having me here. My name is Robert Whitaker. Uh, I'm a journalist and author of a number of books related to the history of psychiatry. And I'm also the founder of a website called madinamerica.com, which is a forum for rethinking psychiatry. We have bloggers, people telling personal stories. We have daily science reports about new findings. We have radio podcasts, uh, continuing education. And this entire initiative came out of a couple of books I wrote, which the latest one called Anatomy of an Epidemic really looked at the the failures of modern psychiatry in terms of a public health model. Because what we see is more and more as we go down this disease model or drugs are the first line of therapy and we get more and more people into treatment, Rather than seeing a reduction in the burden of psychiatric disorders on a public health scale, we're seeing a great increase. So that's why I launched Mad in America, the website, really as a a forum for rethinking how we should uh, think about psychiatric difficulties and how they should be treated at a societal level. Do you think it's weird that we have like, there used to be like this kind of like trending thing where parents would be like, I'm going to find alternative methods to give my kids like maybe a holistic way, which is interesting. I mean, I don't follow the holistic route a hundred percent, but also we still have a huge amount of opioid overdoses that happen every single year. I've actually mentioned this statistic and people will be like, where did you get that from last year alone, 19 to 49 year olds, there were over a hundred thousand deaths. And it's not being talked about on the news. It's not really even being broadcasted anywhere. You have to kind of look that statistic up to be able to find it. And it seemed like I had like six or seven friends die in a matter of a year um, just from opioids and all these types of things that they were overdosing from, which actually made me go to school for chemical dependency. So I know about these issues. The general public might not be so keen on it, but I'm curious, what about psychiatry did you find that really tricked you or got you into this way of writing about the horror stories, I would say, behind it. Well, my entry into this came in a very uh, roundabout way. So I had been covering medicine and science for newspapers and writing in magazines. And then for a time, I was director of publications at Harvard Medical School. So in those ways, I generally reflected on what are conventional understandings, okay? In other words, my writings conf- reflected conventional understandings about medicine, medical therapies in different um, disciplines. But then what happened was I was doing a series for the Boston Globe on abuses of psychiatric patients in research settings, and it was a four-part series. And during that time, and this is in the late 1990s, by the way, And at this time, the story, the conventional story of the American public was this. We had reached psychiatric researchers that found drugs that fixed chemical imbalances in the brain. Uh, And they they were like insulin for diabetes. And this was a real breakthrough. And think about this. This is a story of incredible medical progress. You found the cause, the chemical cause, the molecule that causes madness or depression, and you can fix it. And given the complexity of the brain, that would be one of the greatest medical advances of all time. And I believed it. I wrote about that. But during this time when I was doing a series on for the Boston Globe, I came upon research studies of two types. One was by the World Health Organization. They had con- twice conducted studies that compared outcomes for schizophrenia patients in the U.S. and other developed countries with outcomes in three developing countries, India, Nigeria, and Colombia, for schizophrenia patients. And each time, they found that outcomes were much better in the developing countries. And they actually concluded that living in a developed country is a strong predictor. You won't fully recover from from a diagnosis of schizophrenia, that you're gonna have a worse outcome. Now, after that first such finding, the World Health Organization investigators were quite surprised. And so they hypothesized maybe the reason for the better outcomes in the 
developing countries is that the pedic is that the patients are more medication compliant, which makes sense. If the medications fix a chemical imbalance, and it, then people who stay on the medication should have better outcomes. Well, what they found, and this is with schizophrenia patients, and in our country, we believe you actually absolutely have to have antipsychotic medication long term if you're so diagnosed. They found that outcomes were much better in countries where the drugs were used acutely, short term, but not chronically. And so that was, there was two, and then the other study was done by Harvard Medical School investigators, and they found that outcomes for schizophrenia patients, rather than improving, had declined over the past 30 years, this is in 1990s, and were now no better than they had been 100 years earlier, so that belied that narrative of progress. So that's a long-winded answer to say, I got involved in writing about psychiatry because there was a conventional history out there which told of a great progress once we got these psychiatric drugs introduced into, into you know, psychiatric medicine. That goes back to the 1950s. And that we had a second generation of psychiatric drugs in the 1990s that came to market that were so much better than the first generation. That's a story of progress. And what happened is I stumbled upon data, findings that belied that narrative of progress. So I got interested in this thing. When it comes to psychiatry, do we as a society tell ourselves a story about helping people, about progress that just doesn't stand the test of time? And what you find, my first book was called Mad in America, is, is this is a repeating theme in, in, the, in the history of psychiatry where you'll see some, some type of therapy gets embraced as a great breakthrough and it just, and then 15 years later, it's seen as in fact as harmful or brain damaging, that sort of thing. So that's why I got interested. It's because there's a conventional story that really isn't supported in the science. And you find that again and again in the history of psychiatry as well. Well, you got so many people being put on prescription medications as like, it seems like a temporary thing at the time, but then it becomes permanent and they're ended up taking something for 20, 30 years. And then that's very experienced long-term side effects. I mean, I know someone that was 50 years old when they killed themselves and they had been on since they were a very young age. I mean, to a point where they were taking the same antidepressant over and over and over again daily, like a ritual type thing. And I just go, that doesn't seem right. Like you're not supposed to live taking a pill every single day. Now there are some medical disorders. I believe you have to schizophrenia is one, but I also think we have to understand the classifications of what we call mental health issues. I have ADHD, but that's labeled now a mental health thing. I think there's a huge amount of depression that goes with it, but I would small it on the stage one scale compared to schizophrenia. I consider schizophrenia stage five or stage four. It's this type of thing. That's very, very extreme. And I think that comes with education. See people get depression. I have bad days but I go to sleep and I feel better. So it's not as severe as someone who has it to where they're sticking like a gun in their mouth. Now, I think that needs to be taught more because I feel like what the model has been set to now is a snake biting its own tail. They've brought this medication to you and said, this will fix your depression. Necessarily, are they having depression issues or are they having maybe some bad days and they need to talk to someone? There's other ways we can go to before we jump to the extreme, which is prescribing a medication because next, you know, that person's on it for the rest of their lives and they feel like they are now dependent on that medication. And I think that's where we go now. I think science in the beginning was supposed to be this type of thing. You give somebody a pill and this is going to be the fix for now, but we'll find better methods to be able to do so. But now it's like they've neglected that since the 90s into where we are now, where that's, that's our fix. It works. It still works. Why change it? And I'm like, well, you have a lot of other issues that are now happening now. Like I brought up before to you off air, there's a John Hopkins study about kids that are coming up um, into adulthood that were put on antidepressants when they were young teenagers or younger than that. And now they have a hard time getting aroused or having a hard time with fertility issues. And you start getting into this point of like, now that's a permanent damage. I don't know what we can fix. Maybe you can say, take a Viagra, but that's another pill, but you now have hindered this person's ability to, you know, mature properly because of the fact you might have stunted their growth in some aspects using something that was trying to cure something else. And it's the long-term side of effects, the issues that come with that, where we have enough time on some of these things to see the data in it. But there is also a way too quick of a scale of how we measure if someone needs a prescription 
or not. Like I was mentioning to you, the six questions that you get act in a general practitioner's office on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling today? Have you ever had suicidal thoughts? Um, have you ever thought about hurting yourself or anybody else? There's all these little questions where if you score above a six, they're quick to prescribe Lexapro or anything that can, I mean, really, if you take it long enough, you end up becoming this thing that you feel like you essentially need, which I don't know if it's a physical thing or if that's a psychological thing, but I have friends that have been prescribed medication since they were 14, 13 years old, and they're in their twenties now. And they go, I can't function without this. I'm like, I'm glad with ADHD, I never got put on Adderall. I was able to figure it out and control it. And I, I would say I'm semi good at it. You know, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, but could have been worse. You know, the main thing back then was you give a kid with ADHD, this medication, yeah, the possible hair falling out, weight gain, all these other things. I'm like, these are things that are going to affect you for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, you've, you've raised a lot of issues there. I'm going to just go back to one first thing, and then I'll talk about the larger issue. You mentioned schizophrenia is different than they need to be on medications. Well, one of the surprises when you really dig into the literature is that if you look at the initial group of people diagnosed with schizophrenia, uh, recovery rates, and this comes from the best long-term study done in the United States in the last 50 years, were eight times higher. Long-term recovery rates were eight times higher for the schizophrenia patients who stopped taking their medication. And that finding has actually been uh, sort of supported by research now in other countries as well. Now, there are some patients who need to be on these drugs long-term. I'm talking about people so diagnosed with schizophrenia. But even that in that field, what you really find is you get the best outcomes where you use the drugs more selectively and you figure out who needs them long-term and who, who can get off them. Even with that quote, and you're right, that's about the most severe diagnosis you can get. But even there, the story we are told that they fix a dopamine imbalance in the brain isn't true. That's number one. Two, the drugs actually cause the very sort of abnormality once hypothesized to cause uh, schizophrenia. And it's quite clear from the clinical outcomes studies that what you really wanna do is a, a selective use model, figure out for whom they benefit and for how long. And there's, it's clear that if you can get a person off the medication and build into their lives some of the supports you were talking about there, that give them some meanings, give them some social support, good diet stuff, that that actually increases the risk that people have a, a good long-term outcome. And that's even with that severe diagnosis. That's the first part of what you said, okay? We need to even rethink that. But the second part of what you're talking about where kids get diagnosed with ADHD or everybody's getting diagnosed with depression and put on antidepressants, we have to understand what those two things are. First of all, up until 1980, People, if you look in the diagnostic manual and the, and the understanding by mood disorder experts is there were two types of depression. There was depression that really uh, arose in response to environmental problems. Maybe you lose your job, maybe you get divorced, et cetera, and sometimes diet and all. And those were seen as episodic, okay? That they'll pass, it's just gonna take some time. But it's not seen as an illness. It's seen as a response to an environment that has become problematic. Now, there was a much smaller group of people that were seen as having something more organic in terms of depression, something more physical. And that was the, the, the type of depression that would last longer, okay, and might also tend to a more chronic course. But that's a much smaller, that's a very small percentage of the people who now get treated with antidepressants. So what happened is in 1980, the American Psychiatric Association, when it published the third edition of its Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, no longer observed this distinction between depression sort of related to environmental problems and which can be so to so many and this sort of more biological thing. And they just combined them into one. That dramatically expanded the market for psychiatric, for antidepressants, that's number one. And then two, they even then went very quickly with money flowing from pharmaceutical companies to academic psychiatrists who served as their thought leaders, began to put ordinary unhappiness into the depression category. Oh, you're not you're a little bit unhappy with your life on this day or that day? Here, try an antidepressant, okay? 
And so we really expanded the market for these drugs with the idea that you pretty much should be at least content all the time, which is just ridiculous. We all have our days. So what you're seeing there was they changed our conception of depression. So it invited a lot more people into the use of these drugs, okay? Which is good from a marketing point of view. But now when we look at clinical outcomes for people treated with antidepressants, and then we'll get to the kids in just a second, you see that actually depression now runs a much more chronic course. People who take antidepressants long-term are much more likely to be sort of dysphoric or slightly depressed two, five years later than those who do not take the, the, the drugs. And then there's all sorts of adverse effects with these drugs, sexual dysfunction being one, and there are other things that, that come with that. So what you see in with the use of antidepressants very clearly, you see starting in 1980, a change in the conception of what it means to be depressed and who might be eligible for treatment with a great expansion and uh, with antidepressants seen as the treatment for all of this wide mix of people who can be seen as you know, unhappy or whatever. And that has been a public health disaster. So I took antidepressants probably in 2019 um, for a brief amount of time. I think it was a total of a month. And the way I've been able to relate it to another example is like with my ADHD, my mind never shuts off. But the only time it does is when I do excessive amounts of cardio or very, very intense exercise to where you get that dopamine rush and it's called a runner's high. It's the exact same thing, but I, my my fear in that was – it should never be that easily accessible to get that feeling or that type of thing from just a pill because people tend to, when it says take one, they take two or they take three and it goes into a whole other matter. But when I did that cardio session, it was a reward function. It was something I did excess, excessive amounts of exercise to receive that feeling that was good. But when I stopped taking the antidepressants, I just cut them cold turkey, which they were like, don't do that. But I was like, I can't just, it's, it, this is terrible. It feels like I'm numb all the time. My mind has, I understand that feeling now, but it's never fully came back. You know what I mean? It's like someone took the sunglasses off and then now the sunglasses have came back on. And it's like, imagine taking this for 15 years or 16 years and then getting into a really happy state in your life where you're like, I'm tired of taking medication. I just want to live again. And imagine that downfall, that spiral of trying to come back to what before you took medication ever was. Yeah. Well, on the antidepressants, and we can also then move to kids in here in a bit and ADHD, the, the long-term data on antidepressants is really bad in terms of outcomes. So for example, there was something called the STAR-D trial. You've raised two issues here. What happens to people who stay on these drugs two, five, 10 years? And we had a long-term study called the STAR-D trial. It was the largest antidepressant trial ever conducted. It was uh, funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. And what they and it entered 4,000 people. And as they entered, they would be treated with one antidepressant. And if that didn't work, they could get treated with a second. And there would be these different uh, ability to even change antidepressants in order to mimic sort of regular clinical care. And the, the hypothesis was in this clinical environment, as opposed to an RCT, you could see that people could be, they'd find the right dose, and they would stay well. That was the hypothesis. Here's what happened. Of the 4,041 patients who entered, there were only 108, 3% who were well at the end of one year. Everybody else either never remitted from their depression or they remitted temporarily or, or, and relapsed, or they just dropped out of the study. In other words, they didn't wanna continue with the antidepressant. And what you see over and over again in long-term assessments of people who've been on the antidepressants 5, 10, 15 years, you'll find a lot of people feel numb, dysphoric, have a lot of depressive episodes, and compared to sort of the natural course of depression, they're doing much worse. That's the first problem with the widespread use of these is that, is that as you said, so many people, it turns into instead of a temporary aid into this long-term use. And long-term use is clearly very problematic. Then the problem is if you're on these drugs for long-term antidepressants, you can have a hard time coming off. You can get not just immediate withdrawal symptoms, but you get something called protracted withdrawal symptoms, 
which are abnormalities in feelings and behaviors and sleep cycles, even long after the, the drug has left its bl your, your blood. And the reason is that once you're on these drugs long-term, it changes how your neurotransmitter systems work. Your brain gets adjusted to the presence of the drug. And for many, and it, it seems if you're on long-term and then try to come off, your brain doesn't always renormalize because your brain has gotten used to the presence of the drug. And that's why you get these protracted withdrawal symptoms. So as a medical intervention, what you see is that initial prescribing of an antidepressant, often for a minor temporary problem, right? Turns in, in which it takes a person who's reached a vulnerable moment in their life and sends them down a path where they're likely to become a chronic, quote, mental patient with chronic symptoms and functional impairments and not doing well five, 10, 15, 20 years later. And many people put on an antidepressant will move into the bipolar category at some time. When they move into the bipolar category, they often get put on polypharmacy and then you're really seeing a deteriorating long-term course. So just to sum this part up, it's this. Drugs get approved because they knock down symptoms better than placebo over six weeks, okay? So maybe antidepressants are, do provide a little benefit over placebo over six weeks. But we, the drug approval method doesn't look at what's happening to people at one year, two years, five years, 10 years. And because drugs get approved without any long-term data. And when we look at the long-term data, we see that the introduction of antidepressants into a society causes an increase in public health burden. And by the way, uh, it also is quite clear that the use of antidepressants during pregnancy increases the risk of some adverse effects to the, to the, the, to the fetus. So, and why did this happen? Because pharmaceutical companies were good with working with academic psychiatrists and expanding the market. And, and as you said, creating like, well, you can go on the internet and answer a few questions and they say, oh, it looks like you're depressed. All these sort of screening tools, assessment tools, and those screening and assessment tools are designed to maximize the number of people who say, oh, I might have a problem. I need to go see a doctor and then I get a, a prescription. But that whole thing is, was developed around a commercial uh, aim uh, abetted by the guild interests of psychiatry. And then we can talk in just a second about children because really the medicating of children happened because they were seen as a market to be exploited. Well, I, well the weirdest thing is that the United States and New Zealand are the only two countries in the world that sell or, or do pharmaceutical advertisers. Like we have advertisements on TV of a person spinning in a field of wheat saying, don't you want to feel happy? It's like, yeah, everyone wants to feel fucking happy. And then next thing you know, they ramble off a list of side effects, but nobody's really worried about that because they just want to get the pain that they're experiencing in that moment to stop. Where I just start looking like I get it's multifactorial that there's a lot of things going on, but there used to be a giant stigma about pharmaceutical companies. And then somehow in this pandemic, we have just dropped that and turned to them to be our saviors. Now, as much as I can poke blame it during the pandemic, and I still think there's a lot of business influencing research that's going on such as like if you talk about a who study about antidepressants working look what drug they're or look what disease or mental illness that they're talking about they're usually talking about one of the big ones like schizophrenia but it, then that translates over to adhd that translates over to something maybe not as severe now i will say this with saying that adhd is like a stage one compared to schizophrenia that's a stage five when i went to my doctor and he was like how are you feeling and i explain some symptoms. He goes, well, you have ADHD. Did you know 65% uh, more likely to have suicidal tendencies if you have ADHD? Now, if it gets to that point, I consider it a stage five, but I don't think it should ever get to that point. And I don't think the easiest fix is to give it a pill. I think you need to find other ways like being able to educate more about depression, being able to talk about, first of all, the list of issues that happen with these types of antidepressants, which they say there's not a whole lot of studies done on it. I think there might be. I just don't think the general public knows about it because when you access something like depression, it's going to give you symptoms or treatments and then it'll give you a list of medications to take but what about like those medications if i click into it where are like the side effects at the way way bottom how many people scroll through after reading a bunch about a medication to get to the way way bottom yeah i mean listen this is part of this sort of uh sort of larger societal thinking about drugs uh, it, which is that um we've 
we've been taught to think that if the drug has been marketed and approved by the FDA, it must be good for you. It's going to provide you a benefit. And yeah, there may be some risks and adverse events, but we think those are sort of infrequent or mild. I mean, that's in our general conception because especially over the last 60 years, we were basically uh, you know, prompted to think by marketing. And you talked about the marketing on, on, on TV and all, to think that drugs provide you with a benefit. They're gonna improve your life. So that's sort of the, the standing beginning for thinking about drugs. And unfortunately that conception is mistaken. I mean, it's just <laughs> so many drugs have a risk benefit profile that is very complicated where I think the risks even over the short term outweigh the benefits, but then especially when you start getting into long term, but we're just not primed to think of drugs in that way. We're primed to think of them as, you know, antibiotics were introduced after World War II and they really did they were fantastic. I mean, people used to die from bacterial infections. They were a great advance, but that sort of prompted all of society to start thinking of these miracle drugs, right? These, these uh, magic bullets. Unfortunately, most drugs aren't magic bullets, and that's particularly true in psychiatry because the brain is so complex. But that's the problem. And then, as you say, you can advertise directly to the public and pharmaceutical companies are very efficient businesses in knowing the, how to craft a message, like you're walking on a beach with a beautiful woman or a man, that will sink into your, psychi your psyche, to, to your, into your emotions. And you're no longer thinking about like, oh, let me weigh the risks and benefits. Because yeah, all that like, oh, at the end, it might cause sexual dysfunction, blah, 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 blah. What's really sticking with you is that image. I'd like to be walking on a beach and in love with some beautiful person. Right. And so you always see this sort of tranquility, this happiness, and they wouldn't be running these ads if they didn't know they were effective. Well, some of the biggest antidepressants that they market, if you listen to the side effects, is like actually may cause more depression. I'm like, I don't want to be worse off than where I'm starting off. You know what I mean? But you don't really see that because they distract you with so much stuff, which makes me think like, did this just dramatically from like what you were mentioning, like the nineties, did this just dramatically creep its way in? And this has just been getting worse and worse and worse. Cause then I start getting scared. Like I said, I reached out to you because I came across a bunch of articles about lobotomies that were happening. I mean, in the fifties, there was a whole New York like stage thing of like, come get a free lobotomy. And they did like 250 and that's like sticking an ice pick into your freaking eye and scrambling your brain. And if you see any of these interviews of these people afterwards, they don't seem happy. They seem like just a piece of them was taken away now people say that oh the person did improve how do you know like is it did you do it to a kid well how do you know if it's just a kid being a kid and you're just thinking this is like a disorder like that was with me you know they thought adhd was like this huge disorder but luckily my parents were like he's a kid like he's gonna have a lot of energy he's gonna be like this he'll learn how to fix it or learn how to control it a lot better to where it's not going to be an issue as they were saying it was in the beginning and i think with that kind of like my parents, I, I was very fortunate in that aspect that they had the time and patience to that because that's not the world today. You, people get convinced very easily by these sales pitches to take these types of drugs, which my fear is, is that it's going to creep back into that lobotomy era again. It's not going to be maybe something as severe, but I had a uh, Nancy um, Weiss on my show who exposed the Judge Rothenberg Center for the Developmentally Disabled. Now, what they were using was a form of shock treatment on a kid that was shocked 79 to 100 and something times where he developed third degree burns on the side of his head and severe stress disorder. I mean, and to get another shock was just wincing at getting a shock like these. It was, it, it's, it's worse than a cattle prod, but that's not electroconvulsive therapy. That's something completely different. But the area of neglect in psychiatric medicine, because mental health, even though we talk about being a pro mental health nation, still has a lot of unethical stuff that goes on and, and nobody's addressing it because people push that problem away. And that's a very big issue where I go, we need more education talks like me and you are having not just about pills, but about other forms of treatment and other things as well out there that are happening right now that the field seems like it's advanced, but is it advanced? It seems like it's been stuck in the same spot for a long time. Yeah, the history of psychiatry, and you mentioned lobotomy, is a really complicated one and really a troubled one. Lobotomy, the inventor of a lobotomy was a Portuguese neurologist named Igas Moniz and invented it in the 1936 or something. 
1949, he won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for having invented lobotomy. It was treated in the, in the press as a, as a miracle cure for madness and that researchers had learned how to just pluck out that part of the brain that was the seat of madness. Now, actually what they were plucking out was the frontal lobes. As you said, they went in through the, the, through the eyes they could or they came through and drilled here. Now the frontal lobes, if you have two brains, one from an ape and one from a human being, the difference is the frontal lobes in the human being is much more, much more larger than in the ape. Other than that, the brains are very much similar. You'd have a hard time distinguishing them. So what they really were destroying is the seat of our consciousness, the seat of what makes us human. Now, could they still do sort of, uh, uh, could they sort of uh, speak somewhat okay? Yeah, and could they even do sometimes mathematics? Yeah, because those sort of things. And because of that, by the way, when they assessed the bottom in the 1940s, which were initially done on people in hospitals, they said this, this therapy can only help, it can't harm people. Now, why do they say it could not harm people? Because they basically said these people don't have any worth. And so if they just sit around and look at sort of idly out a window, not caring, that was seen as a, an improvement in behavior. But what happens is once you get that thing said, okay, for the seriously mentally ill or it gets expanded. And as you say, there, there was a time and it was almost come get your free lobotomy. I mean, there was talk about, hey, did you go to college and you're a little anxious? Hey, come in and get a weekend of a lobotomy and you'll no longer be anxious about college. So that's an, the lobotomy story is an example of how a field can fool itself about the merits of its therapies. And that same delusion can then uh, be um, sort of adopted by society as a whole. So that's what the lobotomy story tells us. My point is that within, in the, first of all, in the history of psychiatry, you get a lot of therapies that change people in a way that is, um, makes those around them happier. <laughs> you make people quieter. And that's part of ADHD, by the way, medications, is they make kids stiller in, in, in classrooms and all. More tolerable. But more tolerable. So you see that as a theme throughout the history of psychiatry. But the question is, is it helping the person function long-term? And that's the question we really need to be asking about. And what you see going back to 1980 with the publication of DSM-3, third edition of Psychiatrist Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So what DSM-3 did is, is before this, we all understood that human beings are responsive to environments, that kids are responsive to environments, okay? And after this, we began with psychiatry sort of pushing it, that if you're having a, if you're a child or a youth who doesn't like school, the problem's within your head and not within the school environment. Uh, if you're, you know, going through a divorce and you're, or you're, uh, you've lost a job or something like that, and you're feeling like anxious, nervous, depressed, we don't say any longer that the problem is in the environment. We say, oh, you have a chemical problem in your brain. So all these things are conception. Of, of what it means to be human changes at this with DSM-3. And we put so many of the, the difficulties and we say, it's not in the environment, so it's within the individual and we can fix that environment within the individual. Well, that was the chemical environment. That was a great way to expand the market for psychiatric drugs, to expand the influence of psychiatrists, build a market, but it's not in accord with any understanding of, you know, like, what it means to be human. That's the problem. It's an a-philosophical, an a-historical understanding of what it means to be human. And it's being turned into a disaster. We can talk about ADHD as, a, as well. But as we understand what has happened in the last 25 years, you have to have a historical, philosophical conception of what does it mean to be human? We humans struggle with our minds. Kids struggle with our minds. We struggle with our behaviors. And we have pathologized so much of what is just normal difficulties with our mind, with our interactions with our environment. And we have said the solution is in a pill, but clearly what we've learned in the last 25 years, there isn't a solution in a pill for so many of these ordinary 
difficulties with our environment. It seemed like a lot of it was trial and error in the beginning. It seemed like you could easily experiment on someone. And I would call it human experimentation if you just pick someone and say, well, well, it's, anything's going to be better than this, right? So let's give them a lobotomy or let's give them this. But now with the most of the public or a lot of more people now having mental health issues and really there being an area of concern about it, somehow they still got away with the fact that they go, go get a pill where I just go, is this like society's fault for the fact that we don't have education? Like, I, I think people think that medicine is a lot more advanced than it actually is. It's, it's pretty good. But we also don't have the cure for some things. We don't have the cure for every single thing. This medication might work on your friend, but it might not work on you. But people think, oh, they'll have a pill that'll be able to fix me like that. I'm like, that's not necessarily true. You still need to find other ways to take care of yourself, not just, you know, I like the idea of acute medication interactions where you can do something for a short period and then find ways to just include it briefly and not live your whole life on it. Cause I feel like that's a great start to kind of shift the narrative in a sense. Cause right now there's still more prescriptions being written off and there's not a whole lot of talk about the number of deaths that are following that long-term effects, I would say. Yeah, listen, that's a really key point. Our understanding of drugs as magic bullets comes from short-term use and really with antibiotics, for example. Uh, and then of course in the fifties, we did get the polio vaccine, which what was seen as a sort of miracle cure or miracle treatment. Um, and drugs can have one profile, risk benefit profile over the acute term that is actually very effective for some times. I mean, antibiotics historically were very effective, but there's other short-term drugs that are very effective. Drugs that are taken long-term, first of all, they're not studied for long-term use, but they're almost certain to have a more problematic um, sort of risk benefit profile, just because the body's gonna to adjust to the presence of that drug in numerous ways, among other things. And really what you see in terms of this history of medicine, and we're not just talking about psychiatry, is you see that the chronic use of medications really begins in the 1960s and 1970s. And one time we get the chronic use is because drug companies understand that's the way you really build markets. Because once you get someone has to take it month after month after month, you've got a lifelong customer. So they really pushed the chronic use of medications. But you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to, sh to show that this increased expenditures on drugs is a public health success. I mean, if you look at people 60, 65, most people are taking one, two, three drugs and all. But you know, in terms of life expectancy, the U.S. is, you know, is, I don't know what we are compared to other countries. Maybe it's 20th or 25th. It's actually been, it's stagnated for a long period of time. And why? Because the path to wellness isn't really through a drug. Path to wellness is through things like exercise and good diets and uh, that sort of thing. So if you think it, the path is just in good drugs, you don't pay attention to these other things where you mentioned holistic, whatever you want to call them, but environmental measures for staying well. Uh, and that's part of our problem is we think that the drugs can, can sort of, uh, their chronic use can lead to sort of good long-term health outcomes. And actually over and over again, when you start to see people on drugs long-term, especially if they start two, three drugs, you see a lot of chronicity come in, you see a lot of impairment of physical, emotional, cognitive problems. So this is one of the, this conception of medications in our society, not just psychiatric drugs, really needs to be reevaluated. And really, we should try to go to a, a place where we, as you say, you use drugs more acutely, because that's what they're tested for, and really try to be cautious about their long-term use, because Long-term use, when I wrote this book called Anatomy of an Epidemic, which was published in 2011, that's what it looked at. What are the long-term outcomes for kids diagnosed with ADHD and put on stimulants, or, or adults diagnosed with depression and put on antidepressants, or people for one reason or another being put on antipsychotics? And what you find in the research literature, and there's various types of studies that try to assess long-term outcomes, is... First of all, a good news message that people who did not, who got those diagnoses, but did not take drugs long-term often just had an episode, a time of difficulty, okay? And then they learned to deal with it and they grew and, you know, their lives changed and 
they weren't, quote, mental patients, psychiatric patients long term. So what you see is in the sort of natural course of these disorders, a lot of resilience, a lot of chance for people making changes and just getting well and moving on with their lives. What you see when you look at the long-term course of depression or ADHD or uh, other major disorders, once you medicate it, is you see increased chronicity, increased risk of functional impairment, uh, increased physical problems, and an increased risk you'll move from a milder diagnosis into a more severe diagnosis, like from ADHD to bipolar, that sort of thing. Now, we've mentioned ADHD a couple of times here, and I think this is a, a good thing to focus on. It relates of, close to home. Yeah. Well, first of all, you know, ADHD was, there was no diagnosis for it before 1980. In other words, in the first two editions of the DSM, there was nothing about attention deficit disorder in school. It was I'll say newly... our, my education system didn't go up until 2000. They used to lock me in a room all by myself and consider me mentally challenged. They thought I had to be sent away at some points. At, at what age were you? I was probably seven or eight. In a, in a public school or something? Public school, yeah. I actually left that school in the third grade. Because, and they thought you were so so problematic. They literally put me in the same room as a guest I had on my show, whose brother was the person I described for so long being in that room, who was developmentally disabled. They just didn't understand for it. They didn't have the tools equipped to handle it. It was just easier to push me in a room away from everybody. Isolation, which a common thing with ADHD, if you talk to someone about the mental aspects of it, it is isolation. People, they feel like they're alone 24 seven because more times than not, you have a lot of energy and people necessarily not all the time want to hear you talk 24 seven or want to hear you in these aspects that would be labeled annoying in a simple sense. And it's not, it's not our fault. We just like, for me, time passes. It seems like differently. It seems like I have more be able to fit a lot of words into one saying rather than like a, a minute to you would be different to me. Yeah. Here's the thing. Uh, we were, we've been taught to think that there's this line between people who have ADHD and people who don't have HD, ADHD. That's clearly not true. What happens is you, when you do assessment of ADHD symptoms or the symptoms that are seen as characteristic of ADHD, tapping, attention, whatever, you, you know, you've seen these different ways of, there's different ways they score these symptoms. Okay. They have set up different, uh, you know, I've been tapping my system. foot this whole time we've been talking. Yeah, okay. Listen, I'm sure I would have been diagnosed with ADHD when I was a kid because I was constantly getting in, in, in cases where I got cuts and stuff. I mean, my dad used to say, well, I got, oh, you got eight stitches today. That's great. <laughs> How many are you up to? When you, when you hit 40, it was like a time to celebrate. But anyway, uh, so what you see is there's a spectrum of scores on this scale. And they, in, in order to diagnose it, sometimes they say, okay, we'll, we'll diagnose the 5% that, that are on the upper end of this scale. But that means the person who's, okay, so the, let's say the scale goes from zero to 100 or whatever in terms of the spectrum. And we're gonna take those at the 95th to the 100th percentile. Okay, and we're going to call them ADHD. Other times they'll say, let's take the 90th to the 100th percentile or the 85th to the 100th percentile. They, they shift that line of diagnosis. My point is they make it sound like there's a discrete disorder here. Either you have it or you don't. And that's not, it was constructed as there's some behaviors, tapping your foot, tapping your fingers, not paying attention in school, that sort of thing that are seen as characteristic of people at this end of this spectrum, okay? But I'm just saying it's not a discrete pathology where you have a line that says, oh, this woman has it, and this person on the other side doesn't have it. It just decides where you put that line on that scoring system. That's how we define this category of behavior. That's number one. Number two, we should know is that so often these behaviors occur in, I don't know how you were at home, but a lot of times they occur in school. Yeah. Okay. So you have behaviors in a school that are annoying to the teacher and maybe some and so are disruptive to other students. Well, there have been plenty of examples where they work with the school environment and they change the school environment and ADHD pretty much goes away. It go, becomes much less... Uh, the prevalence goes way down. Why? Because they, it's a place of curiosity. Kids are allowed to go out and play. 
uh, there's some independence of whatever it might be. But there's a guy named Howard Glasser that really works with students to uh, uh, schools to change their classroom. And after he comes in and works in there, the, the prevalence of ADHD goes way down, which shows shows you that in sometimes what we're talking about is a difficulty for some people, particularly boys and younger boys in the classroom, to adjust to a certain environment. Now, the third thing that we need to know about this is the National Institute of Mental Health, beginning in the 90s, conducted a study of stimulants, okay, versus behavioral therapy that was meant to say, do stimulants help kids over the long period of time? So diagnosed. And they did find, you know, they do find that stimulants will reduce the behaviors over the short term that are annoying to others, the tapping, maybe talking too much. If you give someone a stimulant, they'll, they'll, they'll socialize less, that sort of thing. And when they compared it to behavioral therapy, they did find that ADHD symptoms that are seen as characteristic were reduce more in the medicated group than in the behavioral group at the end of 14 months, okay? And so that was seen as, okay, stimulants provide a longer-term benefit. But they continued that study, and at the end of three years, uh, stimulant usage was a marker not of benefit, but of deterioration. And at the end of six years, you saw that those kids, all coming from the same sort of initial block of kids diagnosed with ADHD, those on medication were more fun, were more likely to have ADHD symptoms, more likely to have delinquency problems, more likely to have functional impairment. So what we found was that stimulants didn't help kids grow up and thrive. In fact, it, it, it led to worse outcomes. So one, and then there was an Australia study that said they found the same thing. There was a Canadian study that found the same thing. There's a new study out that says actually stimulants don't even improve academic achievement. So when you get that data, what you say is this, we have a group of kids that maybe not aren't that are difficult or not doing well in classroom environments. Sometimes maybe that's with the home environment too, but the drug approach doesn't improve their lives over the long term. And there's a risk, by the way, with stimulants of a kid with diagnosed with ADHD becoming depressed, becoming psychotic, and then getting another diagnosis related to the stimulant usage. So rather than expand the use of stimulants, why don't we try environmental changes? So for example, I know uh, a world-class climber in, 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 in which we've written about on Madden America in California. He leads um, for, for a long time, and he was an ADHD kid <laughs> growing up and all, but he became an unbelievable rock climber. So he leads climbs up uh, you know, in Yosemite, some of the toughest climbs anywhere. Well, he got interested in helping kids diagnosed with ADHD and also often kids from sort of um, distressed communities. And he taught them rock climbing. And do and you know those kids, they're not ADHD when they're rock climbing. Well, it, for me, it's like always been like a certain thing about energy. Um, if I like, I, I also like, I don't sleep. I just have like, I can sleep two hours and I'm good to go. Um, I've had sleep doctors tell me like, you must be like taking like micro naps or something. You must be like doing 20 minute interval naps. I don't remember those, but one thing when I can get a full eight hours is if I do like a total of like five hours of cardio. Like when I'm burned out to the extreme, I can get some really good sleep. So I just consider like my body just has too much energy to produce. So I can't get that full length of time. The weird thing is if you look into a lot of like the, the kids that, you know, the ADHD that's prescribed to them or medication that's prescribed to them, a lot of times people are like, well, they wanted medication for it. And I go, well, that's also a factor as well too. See, the weird thing is when I noticed is that if I talk all the time and I'm running my mouth off 24 seven around a friend or something, eventually they're like, all right, man, like I need a break or something. But then the one day I come in, like take my work, for example, the one day I come in and I don't say a single word to anybody. And I just kind of give them like a head nod and answer some questions. They go, are you okay? Is everything all right? I'm like, I'm fine. I just don't feel like talking. And then they'll still be curious, like something's got to be wrong. They don't like that version. They like the one that they got used to, the one that they said that was annoying. That's the thing is like people don't know what they want. And but I think that also pushes incentive for them to, you know, people to go sort out these medications to go find this thing. Most of the time, the people that tell people now to get like a medication for something, they're like, yeah, I have this. I have this high 
functioning anxiety that makes me criticize myself and do all this type of stuff. Well, maybe you should go to the doctor. I'm taking this drug and then maybe you can. So then other friends are recommending the drugs to the other people to go get the drugs. And it's like, oh my God, that's the craziest manipulation. It's mind control. That's what it is. To me, that's mind control. It's not your friend mind controlling you. It's the industry that has somehow flipped the narrative to take the blame off of themselves and push it onto you as a person seeking out the help from them. It's got a complete reversal, a complete 180 in the opposite direction it should be, which is that these pharmaceutical companies should be clawing at the neck to get you. Now you're coming to them and clawing at the neck to get what they're offering. And that's where they want you. Yeah, this is a, what you've just described is a, is a brilliant marketing campaign. They changed the narrative. They got us all to think this way, that we need these drugs and that if someone else is having a difficulty, we should tell them to go get this drug. It's a new culture. It's a new way of conversation. It's a new societal narrative that didn't exist before. And it's one that is, you know, it's been created and nurtured by pharmaceutical companies with the, with the aid of American psychiatry as well. And they promoted this to many countries around the world too. But this is a big switch from, you know, the, the, the narrative that was present, say, in the 1970s or 1960s when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I never heard anyone talk about uh, using psychiatric drugs. I didn't know any kid who was on psychiatric drugs. We just knew that kids came in many sort of uh, dimensions of behaviors. You know, there were bullies, there were goof-offs, there were high energy kids that didn't stop talking, there were quiet kids. I mean, people just had a lot of different, there was a spectrum of personalities among kids is the point. And, but they have nurtured a new narrative and here's how success, successful it has been. And by the way, how old are you? 24. Okay, so you're part of a generation that completely grew up in this narrative. Well, and it's on social media, blah, blah, blah. If you look at kids arriving at college today, you know, 18, 19, 20 year olds, something like 25 to 30% of them have a diagnosis now and have a prescription. At many colleges, more than 50% of kids will seek out psychiatric services, mental health services, counseling services during their four years. Well, that what that tells you is there's a societal narrative out there that has been so successful in getting ourselves to think of ourselves as unhappy, anxious, uh, not right in some way. That's a new narrative. And the very fact, and what they have done so successfully, which is just what you described, they've turned all of us into salesmen, right? You have a kid that's not doing well, a daughter or whatever. Oh, you need a drug. You must have a problem which can be fixed by a drug, et cetera. Well, they've, that's just the story of an unbelievable narrative that has been successfully sold to the public, which, which, and, and at the heart of it is a narrative that discomfort, distress is abnormal. That's at the heart of it. It's just, if you're feeling distressed or you're behaving in sort of an anxious way, or even in an annoying way, all those things are abnormal and can be fixed. That's a new conception of human beings. Just read your literature, read your Bible, watch your Shakespeare. All of those things tell us is that human beings are very emotional. They have odd behaviors. There's a spectrum of things. We're not creatures built to just sort of march through life on a steady sort of path at all. But, and you know, where you're sort of okay, content. That's not human nature, but that's the new understanding of human nature is that kids, for example, can go to school and sit at a desk for six hours, and then they can come home and do uh, homework for a couple hours. That would have been the scene for a long time as a view of kids that is just ludicrous. So for example, when I was growing up, and this is the old man thing, I, you know, I'm born in 52, they knew they had to kick kids out of the school every couple of hours to go play and roughhouse and stuff because no one wanted to sit in a seat for too long. And we didn't get homework, especially with elementary school, because the thought was we needed to go home and play. Well, now we have this, what happens to kids today? They don't get nearly as much play time. They're not kicked out on the playground for hours, you know, every couple hours. And who wants to sit in a chair for six hours? That is abnormal. Doing three hours of homework a night is abnormal. So we place demands on our kids and expectations that are out of sync with what it, we're built to be as kids. 
do you, what you're saying sounds so rational, but from the way that the narrative has been drilled into everybody's mind, it comes off can be controversial. Like when I came across the site Mad in America, I was like, oh, is this like a conspiracy stuff? Is this like the all this type of stuff? But then you're reading through it and you're like, no, there's studies behind this. There's rational thinking behind this. There's time and effort put into this information. This is clear that I think everyone could probably agree with it if they sat and talked with you as well, too. They can sense it out. But if you go against the mainstream or what everyone has seen on television or anybody has seen in this, and it's that's brainwashing. That's a point where people right now, if you talk about these types of issues with pharmaceuticals, people know it's happening, but they're not going to read an article about it in fear that it might be like some type of controversial thing. And that becomes an issue. I see it on Twitter all the time. They'll talk about this medication did this or this medication did this. But if it's not being broadcasted on the television or no news person is talking about this drug being good for you and this is a great way to do it. And then they see a, an advertisement of a person spinning around in a field of wheat. They say, oh, that I'm not going to click into that because it's probably some type of clickbait thing and they go away from it. And I think that's a huge issue as we are as a society, because I think a lot of people, if you talk to them and just say, what do you think about pharmaceutical drugs? And they'll be like, oh, yes, they work sometimes, you know, they work. I'm like, but what about the overdoses that go in there? Oh, the overdoses are a big problem. Overdoses are a big problem. OK, what's the statistic on it? They don't know the number. They don't they couldn't tell you a lot, a lot, a lot of people. OK, then why are you backing them? Why are you talking about the, I'm going to take this or I'm going to do this? Is it just because I think a lot of people conflate the severity of it, which is like it's like Tylenol, like people think like a pill like that's like Tylenol. It's like I think a Tylenol, that's it's going to work. Right. And also it's a factor of their illness as well, too. Are you depressed because your life kind of sucks right now? Are you going to be better tomorrow when you go to the beach and hang out with your friends? Or are you really, really depressed where you feel like you're going to hurt yourself? And is this a temporary thing? It's all about time. It's the temporary aspect of it. But I think people go, I've been told I need to go to the doctor, so I must go to the doctor and get this thing. Look, I don't blame the doctors a whole lot. I just think that there's not a lot of incentive for them to do more with their patient workload as well, too. I mean, they got a lot of patients and they got a short amount of time to address these patients. And it's really simple to just give you a pill that they know works for the person that's experiencing similar things. It's hitting in that ballpark. Like you said, people being there's no sliding scale for ADHD. Me being active at school and active at home and all these types of things. If someone just goes, well, he doesn't listen very well. He probably has ADHD like Robbie. Does he or does he not care about the topic that you're talking about? That's the whole thing is there's never that question that's addressed. It's like when I go to my doctor and he's prescribing something, I was prescribed to go see a psychiatrist to deal with some depression issues. And I just ask six or seven questions and they fall off around like four or five. He can't answer every single question. He's like, just go. I'm like, well, hold on a second. Before I go, I want to know, like, what, what am I going there for? What's going to be addressed? Are they going to talk about this? Are they going to focus on this? And the, most of the time the doctors drop off because usually they're not really keen on or not keen, I should say, but they're not used to people asking a lot of questions about certain things right now. In today's time, we are a here, take this. I'm going to write you this. And then you go and pick it up. And then that's what you take. There's a, very few people. And it's, it's kind of like um, at my work, we sign contracts for a gym membership. And when you when someone goes, I go six signatures and one final, uh, uh, one final signature. So it's seven total. They go, what am I signing exactly? That's weird to me because most of the time people just sign and they don't want to know anymore. It's like reading terms and conditions. People don't do it. Yeah. I mean, first of all, going back to Matt in America, the point what we do is we like have daily science reports and, yeah. you know, we, we have resource pages uh, on the drugs related to, uh, you know, what are the research findings about long-term outcomes? So the irony is, so you come and you think, oh, it's just some sort of conspiracy place and all. What really, what we're doing on Mad in America, one of the key things we do is say, here's the real science, which is out of sync with the public narrative. So we try to basically embrace a narrative that, or put forth a narrative that is in, is in concert with the actual science. Um, and once you understand that the science in the literature that rarely gets out to the public is out of sync with what the public is being told, um, then you can see basically the need for rethinking this whole conception. And we have people writing about that. But I just want to emphasize, I was a medical writer for a long time, newspaper report. I was director of publications at Harvard Medical School. The, the, the founding, the sort of driving principle of Mad in America is to make this science known. Because so much of the science, unfortunately, doesn't fit the 
conventional narrative, so it never gets prevent, promoted to the con, you know to the public. That's what I was saying was when someone talks to you, you're rational, and you can look through the, those articles that you have. They're very thoroughly laid out with like a lot of information that I think a lot of people wouldn't be super shocked to, but they would be like, okay, this makes a lot more sense. You know what I mean? But it, it's just the way that we see information now. Usually, a lot of these things are labeled at the bottom. They're not labeled at the top of the results. It's much like a medications per, uh, causes side effects and then tre like treatments to things as well too. The side effects are at the way bottom, and everything else that's good that's gonna it's gonna fix is at the top. Yeah, and also results from long term studies that tell a really dispiriting results with with medication treatment. They're never promoted to the public. That's so dumb. Why would neither you the American that? Psychiatric Association won't promote it? The psychiatric establishment won't promote it, and certainly the pharmaceutical companies won't promote it because it those are those findings threaten that whole paradigm of care. So it threatens psychiatry, which psychiatrists basically the primary product is prescribing drugs. They're not motivated to say, "Uh oh, our drugs are making things worse over the long term." And so obviously the pharmaceutical companies aren't either. So that's one of the problems. We don't give this information to the, to, to, the, to the public. The other thing you talk about doctors doing the prescribing. First of all, yes, doctors grow up somewhat knowing about the evidence, but once they start practicing, they are, as much as anything, they're existing in the same environment to a large extent as the general public. And they're, in other words, they're being presented with the conventional narrative that pharmaceutical companies want to promote. And, and frankly, the American Psychiatry is a guild, and they don't have the time, a lot of them, to actually go into the long-term data or this other data that talks about adverse events, et cetera. There isn't a mechanism for even keeping doctors well-informed about the risk-benefit equation with these drugs. That's number one. Number two, there is something called the allopathic compulsion. So a patient comes to you with a problem, right? And you're not sleeping well, or you're unhappy because of whatever, a divorce, or, you know, going through a tough time at your job. The doctor wants to be able to give you something that making coming to him or her seems worthwhile. That's the compulsion. So when you write a prescription now, that person now leaves the doctor's office thinking something has been done about the problem, right? The doctor is helpful. So there's almost a tacit agreement when the person comes in to see the doctor that you'll leave with a prescription that can help you. And you're not really going to a doctor to the doctor say, well, listen, maybe you should speak to your, you know, start going to counseling or maybe you should change jobs or uh, that sort of thing. Or maybe you should exercise more or change your diet or whatever, make life changes. Now, that's not what your doctor is geared, especially when they have like 15 minute time windows. Yeah. So what happens is we set up a medical establishment, a medical form of care that breeds prescribing of drugs, say an antidepressant or a stimulant or whatever it might be, without any thought of how that will affect the person long term. It's like it is responsive to the demand of the moment of the person coming in to see the doctor that becomes the prescribing ritual that drives things. And that's why we have, I don't know what it is, 20% of our people on psychiatric drug, taking a psychiatric drug each day, something around 20%. I don't agree with Michael Osterholm a whole lot, but one thing he did say that I really agree with is that we don't have a healthcare system. We have a disease care system. Absolutely. And we I, have a disease care system and we have a disease model for psychiatric disorders. Yeah. And I, I think that's not what we need. We need a healthcare system. So I'm just wondering, and do you think in like the next five years, you think in the next 10 years that more people are going to wake up to it with the mass amount of people that are experiencing more symptoms or more issues when it comes to mental health? Like it seems like ADHD, as much as people say like, oh, I have that too. They might use it like it, they might beat the crap out of it in the way that they use it. But in a sense, it's like when more people are talking about it more, there's been a lot less stigma placed on it where I have nephews that have uh, ADHD or have maybe they're just kids. I don't know. But from what I've seen and what I've you know heard from whatever they, them going to the doctors and doctors saying that they have it. Um, I'm starting to be like, this is going to be, if you, even if you do, this is going to be something that's going to be looked at a lot differently than when I was in school. And I wish that would have been the same case. I'm not trying to like say a bad story or like a, or poor me situation, but if I was a different person or I didn't have like uh, the, just the idea of like, maybe I should go to a different school, which a lot of kids don't even have that thought. 
there you're stuck in a situation where now I could have been hooked on drugs at uh, Adderall, anything. And I could be still taking that today. And I could be taking it till I was in my forties or something and then stop taking it. And the next thing you know, experience a whole host of problems. Yeah. I mean, if your life could have gone down a very different path, a path of continual. Imagine if I was more successful, that would be insane. I would have taken it. <laughs> Listen, the, well, part of life is just making your way through life. And life has so many surprises, especially if you aren't medicated, you're going to have some difficult times, but you'll also have some successes. It's just an adventure is what it is. It's not some steady state thing. Um, yeah, next, I mean, next five years. Next five years. Yeah, this is sort of the last question. I'm pretty pessimistic. Okay. The reason is it could, because and you put your well, you put your finger on it. We have a disease model system of care that that uh, in terms of percentage of the gross national product, it's about twenty percent. So that means a lot of people are in the essence invested in that system of care because it's, it's creating a lot of jobs and all going to like a mental wellness. I mean, there are certainly, there's certainly that talk about there. How do you stay well, physical wellness? And people talk about diet and exercise, but there's not nearly so much profit in mental wellness efforts uh, because so much of it comes to people making changes with how they live. Um, and two, it, it, it's just, it's just a way from our capitalistic way of being. It yeah. just is it, our, our way of capitalistic way of being has built up this disease model. And there's so much, you know, we have lobbyists that are invested in it. It's really hard to change because it is in essence a for-profit system. And we have lobbyists that give gobs of money to, uh, you know, our congressmen, et cetera, to, to prevent, uh, you know, large scale change. I, I hope, there, and there's signs of this, that there'll be a grassroots revolution, grassroots change saying, we need to take care of ourselves early on and, and find ways to live healthier lives. But it won't come from the top down, I don't think. And, but you have put your finger on the problem. We have a disease system. We don't have a healthcare system. Well, Robert, I appreciate the time you've given me to be able to discuss um, a topic like this. It's a heavy one indeed. Um, but is there a place where people can find your links, madinamerica.com? Um, is it .com or .org? It's .com because we initially we weren't a nonprofit. We are a nonprofit now. But uh, So yeah, madinamerica.com. You can go on there. Uh, you can find resource articles. You can find podcasts about people talking about this. You can find our own journalistic reports and something called MIA reports. You'll find a lot of, you'll find art galleries. Uh, you'll find a lot on there. If you want to contact me, you just go to the contact and, and you pull down how to contact people and my name will come up and you can contact me. And, and it, it's really easy. It's just rwhitaker at madinamerica.com. That's my email. I'll make sure I link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you, Robert. And thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.